Good looking guy. Good looking guy. Oh, so okay. people. All right. Yes. We'll go ahead and start. Uh, thank you all for coming here today. You know, uh, usually during the summer, we're a, a, a little bit slower. You know, we kind of follow the academic year, so to speak, in terms of having events. But this summer, we, we've we actually been steaming full steam ahead. We had a, an amazing trip to a farm a couple of weeks ago, the Apricot Lanes Farm. And um, we have this uh, wonderful event tonight, and we've, we've had uh, lots of study sessions. We have another one coming up this Saturday that I hope uh, many of you can be at. So um, I just wanted to say thank you all for coming out on this Thursday evening. And um, Stuart, please uh, welcome our guest. My pleasure. Uh, we're really honored again to have Pat Edwards, Patrick Edwards, uh, join us and talk to us about his extraordinary career and some of his thoughts and his connection to da to David Pye, who he's been long been a champion of the artisanry and the artistry and the philosophy of David Pye, which is very Ruskinian. Um, full name William Patrick Edwards was born in Los Angeles in 1948, raised in San Diego, where his studio is located. He studied physics at University of California great training for uh, an antiquarian, and uh, graduated with a BA in applied physics and information science. But Pat, long interested in antique furniture, uh, started an antique restoration business uh, some, uh, what was it, 50 years ago, really. And since then, he's been in conservation and restoration of pre-industrial furniture using hand tools only and traditional methods and materials. Ruskin would be very, very proud. From uh, 1976 to 1985, he worked as the furniture conservator for the uh, 1864 Phineas Banning Residence Museum in Wilmington. <laughs> and my wife was the director at the time. They were pals. And that's how we met, actually. But in 1992, he studied under Dr. Pierre Ramon at the Ecole Boulle in Paris. Pat Edwards received the support of Dr. Ramon in launching his own school, the American School of French Marquetry in San Diego, a unique situation, which allows him to divide his time between working on furniture conservation in a, in a business context and teaching marquetry in the school. He's authored many articles on his philosophy of work and the traditional techniques of marquetry. And it is a great pleasure to welcome Pat Edwards to our Rusk mm. Symposium tonight. Patrick. I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm in tears. I'm going home. <clears throat> uh, Stuart, you're wonderful. Thank you guys for having me. Um, it's, it has been a, an interesting uh, 50 some years. Um, you know, when I, uh, growing up in Southern California, uh, actually before Disneyland was built, um, all I could do at home was read science fiction books. And so I got really thinking about science and atomic power and the energy. And uh, so I, I thought, well, I'll just be, I'll be a physicist. I'll go and do physics. And um, I went ahead in, in high school, I had to build a science fair project. And so I decided, well, why not build a linear electron accelerator? That seems like a, obvious thing to do as a, a student of physics. And so I built that and I won sweepstakes at the science fair and the summer of 67, they told me I could go to the national science fair and represent San Diego with my uh, accelerator. And I said to my parents, I'd rather go to Europe and ride a bicycle. I think it's what I'm looking for is quite different. And it was, for me, the grand tour to see Europe as a Southern Californian where nothing is over 50 years old anyway. And to go to Europe and see castles and museums and ride a bicycle around it. And, and uh, but, but that was when I went, when I came back in 67, I immediately went to work at the physics department at UCSD. And in 68, as a, uh, a student undergraduate in physics, and employed by the physics department at UCSD, I spent the entire year as a 19-year-old at Brookhaven Laboratories in Long Island working on a very, very large accelerator, the biggest in the country at the time, 
uh, for a full year. So here I am in Long Island in a government facility at 19 and um, full into physics, you know, 70, 80 hours a week. Uh, when I wasn't doing physics, all I had to do, because we're isolated, was read. And so I had three sources of material to read. Obviously, for my career, I was reading Feynman's lectures on physics from Caltech, the Red Books. And that gave me an understanding of what I was supposed to be doing as a job, you know, as a young kid working in physics. But from a couple of years earlier in high school, I had a social studies teacher in 65 who was very progressive, Mr. Brosio. And he told us we had to get the Bertrand Russell history of Western philosophy and read that at, at what, 16. <laughs> so I was reading this in my, in my room after reading Feynman and on, and this is 1968. And on one of those uh, excursions off the base, I took the government car and I uh, went into Stony Brook and I found a bookstore and in the bookstore, I found, the book you see here. And since I was busy reading philosophy from Bertrand Russell, I, I was attracted to the way that this author, David Pye, wrote and how he used logic and consistency and specific language to express ideas in a, in a fairly philosophical way. But it was woodworking. I mean, I was not a woodworker, but that's what he, he was doing. He also, <clears throat> he also was 40 years older than me. And so that's a different generation of um, attitude. <clears throat> when he was writing in the 60s, I was a kind of a hippie physicist, you know, and, and, uh, and the way he was writing was from a generational approach much different than us kids in the 60s. He was writing from somebody in the in, with a, who grew up in the in the forties and uh, the twenties actually, and and so I had some disagreements with him about his attitude about um, concise compartmentalizing concepts and words. I was much more open to interpretation and taking these things that worked for me out of context and making them work for my life. And most importantly, one of those was this idea of the workmanship of risk and the workmanship of certainty. And it's throughout the book, but basically, if the result is um, con completely controlled, in other words, you put in A and B and you get A and B out, it's exactly the same and nothing has changed, it's certain what's going to happen, then... Um, that's kind of what we were doing in physics, because even though we're doing smashing atoms and trying to capture events and everything, we didn't want any unknowns or any risk to uh, affect the data. We wanted to make sure that we had calculated every single thing that went into this reaction so that what came out, we could anticipate. Basically, in particle physics, it's pretty simple. You take a known quantity <clears throat> of energy and mass and you smash it and you measure the pieces coming out in energy and mass and something might be missing. So you do that, say, 10 million times because the odds of probability. And then on 10 million times, you get enough data about what's missing to give it a name. <clears throat> so you call it, you know, a quark or a muon or a meson or some kind of silly thing like that. <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and you apply for more research money because there must be something else to do. And that's that's the job of physics, high energy particle physics. But it does not allow for unknowns and risk. You have to know for sure that what, can, what you found exists. So here comes this guy and he writes, well, wait a minute, what if... Uh, what if it's not well known? What if you take a risk and, and, it, and it comes out you know, this way? That's the workmanship of risk. Now, in a simplistic term, you might think to yourself, that means before the industrial age, there was no machinery. 
there was just basically guys with axes and, and uh, you know, pens and things that they did to create stuff. And then the industrial revolution comes along and the machines produce cars and the cars are all predictably the same. It's, it's not quite that simple because <clears throat> he goes through and discusses um, another, another author's interpretation of these different ages of uh, technological advance, the Uton, U, eutechnic phase. He talks about going back from the Middle Ages to the 18th century being an age where water and wood were the mediums. <clears throat> then he goes into the <clears throat> Paleotechnic Age, which I interpret as the Industrial Revolution, 19th century, where coal and iron become the medium of, of evolution for technology. Then he includes in his age, the 20th century, the Neotechnic Age of the 20th century, where electricity, thank you, Edison and Tesla, and alloys, aluminum, and, and uh, new elements that were developed, <clears throat> plastics, for example, petroleum products, change everything in, in that century. But remember, he wrote in the 68, what have we done in the last 50 years? We've got a new age. He would be amazed at the age we're in now, which I'm doing, going to call, for example, the virtual reality age. <laughs> because we we developed silicone di driven um, computer virtual reality. I mean that's that's something unknown in 1968. All of that stuff, and we're going to see the fruits of that in in this next generation. And I'm going to live my life out watching that happen. We all are. Um, so in terms of dividing these things up into ages, for me, <clears throat> it's basically, uh, pre-industrial and industrial. I, I don't get into the nuances of these specific things because, um, um, the, the pre-industrial age suffices for my argument that basically in a, in a kind of a pseudo romantic way, uh, furniture was made entirely with with human power the tree was harvested uh with uh, with human power slaves in cuba for example who would bring it out to the ship and the ship would use wind power to get transport it up the coast and the logs would be dropped off with using oxes and taken to a water driven uh sawmill and roughly sawn and then taken to a cabinet shop where it would be air dried and then worked subsequently entirely by hand. And for me, that's what changed with the Industrial Revolution. They developed um, chainsaws, so they didn't need slaves to cut down the trees. They had tractors to move them out. They didn't need the oxen. They had trains and, and uh, ways to transport it. And they had machinery that can mill it. And you put two inches, you put two inches on the dial and the board comes out two inches. That's the workmanship of certainty as far as I'm concerned, because you can dial it in and get two inches every single time. Whereas previously you had to plane it down until you get to two inches or plus or minus, but it didn't really matter because whatever size it was would work with the next piece you made. So <clears throat> the summary for those who haven't read the book, from my perspective, that I concluded is that there are changes in the relationship between the worker. Now we'll just say worker because most of the time it was men, but I'm not gonna say that. It's the worker and the material and the tool. Okay, three things, the worker, the human, uh, the material, the wood, and whatever tool you choose to use. So it's the relationship between these things that changes from the workmanship of risk to the workmanship of certainty. So in my world, which is the workmanship of risk, I, the human, hold the tool, which may be 
the same tool that a Roman would use, a chisel, a plane, a hammer, a saw. That tool hasn't changed for 2,000 years. And I would work that tool against the material. Human holds tool against material. And I take a risk that when I carve the leg, I carve it down nice and dense, delicate, but I don't go too far because if I understand the material and I use my tool and I cut the wood down too far, then the leg breaks. And so I'm using judgment as a human, controlling the tool, taking risks that the grain might be ornery, I might hit a bad spot in the wood, I might break the leg, but I might succeed. So if I take a risk and I fail, I learn something. If I take a risk and I succeed, I'm proud of what I did. I get pride in being able to control the tool, understand the material, and produce the desired results. The workmanship of certainty is where the worker feeds the material into the tool. So now the tool becomes the deciding factor. The tool decides whether it's two inches or not. The worker is just a helper feeding the machine. And as a hippie, as an old guy in the 60s, and as a hippie in the 60s, I'm still an old guy, um, I didn't want to be working for the man, which I was doing in physics. I was basically working for the man. Show up on time, do your job, get your paycheck, go home. No pride of work. Uh, Friday at five o'clock, hopefully you get to go home. That didn't happen for me. I was in research. We worked seven days a week. But you can see working in a factory, you are reduced to the, the worker feeding the machine material. And there's not much pride in that. And so I did not want to do that. And the, the, the real intellectual result of this was if I hold the tool and I work it against the material and I succeed, eventually I'm going to be able to call myself a master of that trade. Something that David Pye doesn't like to say, skill. He doesn't like the word skill. Well, I love the word skill. I have great skill in what I do. And it's a learned experience to be able to master these trades to produce the result that I want. And, and I'm still in control, so I'm a master. Now, in certainty, you have the machine. So what do you do if you want to get better? You get a better machine. You buy a better table saw. You buy a better router. You buy a better CNC machine. You buy more and more consumption of expensive equipment because that's what's going to make you a better worker, more efficient, faster, go home early that kind of thing. So you end up spending a lot of money consuming all these power tools and using them to get done faster so you can leave work and go do something you really want to do. Well, that's not what I want to do. I want to, I want to work. I still want to work. I'm in my 70s and I want to work because of this philosophy. So I had a, uh, a Japanese cabinet maker who's maybe 95 years old now, Toshio Odati. He's a very famous Japanese cabinet maker. And he and I were both working on um, these woodworking events, these public exhibitions that go around the country years ago. And I was demonstrating marquetry and I would spend a lot of time cutting out little tiny pieces and putting them in my tray and the spectators would all come by and they either said one of two things. They either said, I can, I, can make, I can put a motor on that machine and make it work better than that. And I go, really? I'm, I'm doing this. Uh, or more importantly, they would come by and they would go, wow, that takes a lot of patience. And I didn't have the right answer for that. I, I came up with this really lame analogy, which is no, um, golf takes a lot of patience because you hit the ball and then you go chase it. And then you hit it again, you go chase it. What, What's the point of that? That must take a lot of patience to go out and walk 18 holes and hit the golf ball for no reason. That didn't work with these guys because they all play golf. <laughs> and, and, 
they uh, they thought, hey, I don't know what I'm talking about. So I wandered over to Toshio Odati's booth when I took a break, and I watched this man who was my senior by quite a few years. And he had a big Japanese saw and he was cutting a board that might have been two feet wide and six feet tall. And he was patiently sawing away a quarter inch piece of wood going down the saw, taking all day, just sawing the wood. And I'm standing there watching him. And he's just a beautiful thing. And one of the guys next to me says, hey, that must take a lot of patience. And in a true Japanese sensei fashion, he thought for a moment and then he turned and he looked at the guy and he said, why would I do something in 10 minutes that I could do all day long? <laughs> so I've been using that because uh, Pai does discuss passion. He, that's where I get excited about what he's talking about because he talks about passion. But he uh, he gets into other things that, that he doesn't bring that out. For me, the passion of the process is the most important part of it. People ask me, because I make very complicated things, that um, how can I get rid of them after I've spent eight or 900 hours of time building something very complicated it must they say it must hurt when you have to give it away or sell it or you no longer have it and i look at them and i and i in my own way which is kind of primitive and, and brutal um but i tell them i enjoy the conception i enjoy the the process of being pregnant i enjoy creating something new the whole evolutionary thing of conception and 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 gestation and 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 delivery, but I don't like kids, and so I don't mind being pregnant all the time because I'm creating these wonderful things, but somebody has to adopt them because they're just in the way. After they're done, they no longer interest me because all the complicated stuff is figured out and there's nothing more intellectual that I can get out of a static object that doesn't require any interaction. So that's Great. for me what, what the process of, of working now for 55 years, seven days a week at woodworking at marketry, how I can do that. I mean, why I'm not ever going to retire. I don't see a, if I retire, what am I going to do? I don't have anything else to do. Um, so uh, to get back to Pi, because he did affect me in 68. I went on to get my degree. But because of um, the way he looks at things, if you look at this book, he looks at things in a very critical way. And I began to look at uh, woodworking and furniture in a very uh, forensics way. How was it made? What process? produced it. And so in my workshop, I was constantly trying, I mean, I'm, I'm working in a workshop with the only electricity is the lights overhead, the radio, which plays, you know, Pink Floyd or something, and glue pot, which is electric. Everything else is manual. So I'm sitting in this workshop thinking, you know, I'm a physicist. I understand what intrinsically happens when you throw the light switch and the incandescent bulb or the fluorescent bulb creates a plasma and produces light and electrons fall on things and I see them. I, that's How do I get rid of all that knowledge of technology that was put in my head and think like a pre-industrial woodworker? And it took me a long time to realize that I was still under the influence of uh, Lewis Sullivan and the, uh, the architectural movement that form ever follows function. 1904, seven, something like that. Form follows function. You can ask anybody, they don't know anything about architecture or Lewis Sullivan, but you'll say form follows and they'll go function. Something. <laughs> so I thought there must be something before the, before the Industrial Revolution, 
other than function that was the derivative what would derive the form and so i came up with an essay which i wrote and and was published by the society of period furniture makers form follows process the process of making the thing which goes back to the worker and the tools and the relationship between the worker and the wood and the tools that process creates the form as a natural result of that methodology. Now, if you want to read that paper, um, you go to my website, which is my name, wpatrickedwards.com. And I have all many of my papers on that website, one of which is form follows process. And um, it explains a little more in detail what my concept of this pre-industrial revolutionary <clears throat> attitude was. And uh, um, so enjoy that. Um, but if you Google form follows, the algorithm will come up with function every time. So, you know, try and fight the internet and find uh, another way of thinking about things that the process is uh, what creates the form. Um, so one, uh, one example of that might be that I have a molding plane and it produces a specific profile. Well, when I make the molding, that profile is going to be in the form. And so, you know, it's, it's just because I have that tool that that form uh, exists. Another ex is the way they dealt with expansion of wood in pre-industrial times, the wood expands and contracts. They didn't have plywood. So in order to make it stable, they would put a frame around a panel, which would float in a frame. So frame and panel construction with draw bore, mortise and tenon joints was the form as a direct result of the process of working hand tooled wood to produce stable furniture that wouldn't crack over time. Now plywood comes out and of course, everything's made out of plywood. The process of using plywood creates the form. But uh, um, I think up until Louis Sullivan, my argument is that the process created the form, not the function. Um, in in Pi's book, these definitions are very, very well thought out. He spends way too much time discussing definitions. Like on page 51, for example, he has um, technique, Technology is basically the evolution of technique, the workmanship, the good workmanship, the bad workmanship, skill, again, is a word not used in this book. And uh, um, he says basically um, that skill, using the term skill, is a, a starting point to an argument. <laughs> okay, let's have that argument. <laughs> um, and then he gets into the um, the word craftsman. One can no longer use the word craftsman. It is getting fly blown. Too many cranks and too many people trying to grab higher wages have called themselves by it. Well, what am I? I'm not just a worker. I have a craft. I have a skill. I don't mind calling myself a craftsman. Um, in my day, now, the term that I have trouble with is handmade. Of course it's handmade. Even if it's a machine, somebody handled it. <laughs> There's Kristen. Somebody okay. handled it. So handmade is, is totally um, overdone. She's, she's giving me the television. Oh, it's 5.30. It's only 5.30. I know. Hold on. I'm not done. I'm not done beating pie to death yet. As much as I love the guy, plenty of time. Um, one of one people are still confused about the risk thing. To put it into analogy, he uses writing with a pen as a risk compared to um, printing. But to be fair, he points out that before the printing press could happen, somebody had to carve out those little letters in a, in a block to get imprint. You know, so. There was some risk involved in creating the letter A, B, C, D, putting it in the, in the press and 
all the other risky things of jigging up for the workmanship of certainty. Um, I don't really make those distinctions in my life because everything I do is risky and I never end up with something that's going to be predictable. Um, but um, uh, I do have trouble with skill and I do have, uh, I, I, I like the word skill. I don't like the word handmade. That's what I'm trying to say. So um, handmade is something that's, if, if, if you are, um, if you are only going to read some of Pi, you can leave out chapters seven and nine. <laughs> His discussion of diversity and equivalosity leave me dead. I don't, I don't, uh, I mean, diversity is fairly important. He includes it in his conclusion that when you have the workmanship of certainty, Kristen, I'm fine. We will have a discussion there. Let me finish. Stuart, you know, <laughs> barely. Um, my thought, Equ e diversity, he points out in his conclusion, is something as a goal of the workmanship of certainty, but it'll never happen. Um, equival equivocality is the weirdest thing. He points out on page 97, figure six shows the effects of defects in marquetry, which add nothing to the quality of old furniture. I take that personally. <laughs> My job is marquetry, but, but, so just anyway, skip chapter nine. Um, and, and he points out, do not torture the material. Well, have you seen any Art Nouveau furniture made of wood? That's called torturing the material. It doesn't, it's not supposed to do that. Um, uh, so finally, in chapter 10, really, if you're going to skip the book, just read chapter 10, because that's where he gets into Morris and Ruskin and completely dissects their approach through his eyes of the Renaissance period and the pre-industrial age and the Romantic art. Um, however, he does say on page 114, art is the expression of man's pleasure in labor. That's as close as I can get to Toshio Dadi's statement of why I would do something in 10 minutes that I could do all day long. The expression of man's pleasure in labor is art. Okay. And so from that, you can derive some pride. And I take great pride in what I do when it's done. I just don't want to have it around anymore. Um, my actual business model for the fat past hundred and for the past 50 years is expressed quite discreetly on page 134, my business model. Um, it is sometimes hoped that a man can set up as say a cabinet maker and aim at making a few pieces of the very best quality each year. So long as he keeps himself solvent by making other furniture to order or for sale in competition with the manufacturers. In other words, you gotta have a main job for your part-time passion. Um, some good furniture is being made in this way, but very, very little of the very best. The man who does it is likely to find that to make a moderate living, he has to become a manager more than a maker, sales manager, works manager, dispatch manager, buyer, accountant, secretary, all rolled into one. Whatever he does, all of the best quality will have to be done on a sideline, very likely at weekends. So what I do is, I have figured out in my business model exactly how much money I need to make every day for 365 days a year for my overhead, my, my lifestyle. That means that, for example, I spend three hours every day repairing chairs, repairing antiques, repairing jobs to make my overhead. That gives me eight hours for my passion, which is building incredibly complicated things and selling them. So that business model has worked for me for 50 years. And once I figured out how to get my overhead paid within my skill level of woodworking, 
I've never had to worry about um, a paycheck because I don't get one. So um, the conclusion on 139, I'll end with this. Free workmanship is one of the main sources of diversity, which he's after. To achieve diversity in all its possible manifestations is the chief reason for continuing the workmanship of risk as a productive undertaking. In other words, for perpetuating craftsmanship. So that's me, that's what I do. And that's how I interpreted Pi and how it changed my life. The rest of my decisions were all done with Bertrand Russell and Richard Feynman. So I have three men to thank for where I am today, um, besides my, my teachers. So that's it for me. Love you both. Well, as the moderator tonight, uh, I saw that David Judson asked the question of uh, making a distinction, Patrick, between the term artisan and the term craftsman. Uh, are they synonymous for you? Uh, I would think they are. Let me ask you, and you're perfect to answer this question. Is marquetry on the surface of a piece of furniture fine art or decorative art? Fine art. I like you. <laughs> How come you're not making the decisions of the auction houses and all the investors who only buy fine art? Well, they're dim. <laughs> I think this is the answer to your question because uh, marquetry, in my mind, is art in all media. There's artists who work in sculpture. There's artists who work in stone. There's artists who work in wood in all media. And that should all be considered fine art. And, and you just should add some zeros to the value. Whereas decorative art is just a table, is just with fancy covering, or is it, you know, a cabinet that looks pretty. That's unfortunate. Well, I don't think that quite answers David's question, which is the okay. distinction between artisan as a term and craftsman as a term. David, do you want to take tackle that yourself? Yeah, I, I, I don't know that I'd make much of a distinction from it it is interesting because um you know obviously it's it's gender neutral so it's uh, a little more timely in that sense but i i believe artisan uh takes craft out of that kind of position so i think to what 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 you're saying patrick is that it, it is an an art term rather than saying craft you're saying art uh, in a way so i think that in a way is is um uh, to me, has a little more power to it in 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 some regards. Um, I, I cannot recall the word artisan being used by David Pye. No, and I don't think he does. And um, uh, but I think that um, uh, you, we we kind of are constantly challenged with these things. I think artisan has a has a just a different kind of perspective. Craftsman. To, to me, to certainly har harkens back to the craftsman movement and the period and that kind of thing. There's so many more con connotations with it than an artisan, but you know, I think it's they're very similar terms. I, I would, in my impulse to answer your question, is that a craftsman has to understand the materials he's working with uh, more than an artisan who may be more free to throw paint on the wall and not know what it does. To, to loosely generalize art, sorry, mm -hmm. but uh, I mean, Pollock did it. I can talk about it, you know, just to throw paint out of the wall. I wouldn't call uh, Pollock a uh, 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 craftsman, <laughs> yeah. but he was, he was certainly an artist. And I imagine in his realm, they would call him an artisan, but I think it has to do with um, uh, uh, perhaps I don't know, a technical understanding of the materials you're working with. I, that's, as I say it, it doesn't, doesn't sound right either. So, no, but so. I, I, I intuited that as well, that, that craftsman does connote material and, and a master. Uh, proper joinery has to be proper joinery. Yeah. An artisan yeah. doesn't care that much about it, but a craftsman yeah. makes it work. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. It, it, is, it, is, well, it is interesting that it's not in his book at all. The artisan is a... The definition is a skilled trade. Um, and so you wouldn't call, you wouldn't call, you as you say, you wouldn't call Pollock um, an artisan. 
right? He doesn't have a skilled trade that involves making things by hand, which is yeah. technically yeah. the definition. But but <clears throat> I know that Suzanne Iskin at the Craft Contemporary Museum really was able to create some, I think, some valuable bridges between some of this terminology and also um, between um, artisans and, and craft and, and art. Um, Cause she really had these wonderful for years, these wonderful exhibits that were, you know, were as good as any art opening that I've been to in years. So, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting, just the word, just the fact that it contains the word art sort of implies <laughs> a little more than, than, than the well, word. I, I might, I might add in response to that, that the creativity even though what I do is creative, I think creativity would be more in an artisan's venue to be creative rather than a craftsman who has a kind of a design goal that's predetermined. I know what the cabinet's going to be. I know what the design's going to be. Um, and uh, that's a good distinction. Yeah. Maybe the creativity element that distinguishes the two. I want to push that just one degree further in the direction Elena was going, I think, where the notion of art as a term or artist as a a maker uh, suggests that one is incorporating uh, uh, creativity of ideas, not just creativity of form, creativity of sociological, philosophical, really, you can see what happened with Duchamp, this conceptual thing yeah. happened, which is yeah. certainly not craftsmanlike at all. It's the opposite. The object matters not. Mm -hmm. So that's really the end sure. game. Oh, I think I think you've got it because I've stood next to you in art galleries and had you explain modern art to me in very intellectual philosophical arguments. But if you stood next to me and I described a piece of marquetry furniture to you, it would be more technical, like what abilities were used to make this happen and understanding the, the medium, the mar marquetry and the wood and the process, not any philosophical or creative background except for the social context of what it was used for and the class of people who might use it but that's not the stuff you get from modern art you get a whole different thing from modern art the way you've tried to educate me <laughs> yeah putting cottage cheese into a brick wall <laughs> you enjoyed meeting robert Irwin. i remember when we oh were yes yes i i introduced you to robert Irwin. <laughs> Wait, we had a wonderful conversation <laughs> robert my Robert Irwin was my father's student at Chenard. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, sir. You know, we, we try to define things and compartmentalize them, but the best of art really is to have the creativity with the skill that is brought to your head. So what is that, Beverly? Is that an artisan or a craftsman? <laughs> <laughs> an artistic craftsman. <laughs> it's workmanship, according to Pi. That's right. You know, but but the part, and I think the whole point is that we cannot lose the creativity that's involved and the effort yeah. brings skill to. You know, the, the word, I think the word that's not being used here is humanity. I think that the workmanship of risk re reflects our humanity, whereas the workmanship of certainty is autonomous. It's not, it's yeah. not flesh and blood. Well, very interestingly, just to bring it to a current impasse, you know, this writer's strike is is totally bad. It's exactly what that is. Who uh, this wonderful critic um, on on the LA Times actually talked about except that used that word humanity. Yeah. And the fact is, they they're arguing over, and the sticking point is AI, and can that take over the jobs of the of writers? who express humanity and compassion to uh, yeah. people in a way that AI is never going to be able to do. Well, it's interesting because language is does set up equations. And so you can see why some guy that wants to make fast money would be interested in AI. But it's still, like you were saying, it doesn't engage the imagination. It doesn't really engage the human sort of... Um, what with risk? Let's go back to risk because risk is such an important part of the imagination. It's it's the unexpected. 
That's Beverly, right. um, going back to what you said about AI, you know, a lot of graphic designers are really concerned about it because um, these image generation programs are creating I, sort of new art, but it's like Frankenstein art, really. But they're creating stuff based on these large models of like all the images on the Internet. And um, some of my colleagues at, at work at USC have now turned to using these AI generated images for their promotional materials, yeah. uh, you know, kind of thus avoiding uh, getting graphic designers involved. And uh, so I, I can see the, the danger there. Now, Patrick, there, there's no way AI is going to be taking over your work. I mean, that's just that can't happen, really. You know, I realized that when I chose antiques that um a lot of businesses could be offshored and and subbed out to uh, countries that have cheap labor, and it'd be very hard to do antique conservation and restoration as an outsourced labor. And um, that's that's the business side of it. Now, the pieces I make, I hope someday that people look at them and go, "Do you realize that was made by a human?" <laughs> and that may be the ultimate. Is be like. Today we have food which is labeled organic and we food that's not organic. My opinion is the food that's not organic should be labeled toxic and organic yeah. would be the norm, okay? So in the future, it may be human or AI. And it may be that uh, some video is, you know, identified by some organic logo as being made by a human without any AI involvement. And it may they may have to do that to to help people decide what they're looking at. A friend of mine recently asked me if I were concerned about if I was concerned about AI from the point of view of poetry, Elena, and how that might affect uh, the literary arts. And um, I was uh, I told him that uh, I, I cited the use that David Hockney has been making of the iPad and making drawings on the iPad. I yeah. find them abysmal. I don't like them a single bit. Uh, <laughs> on downhill but that's my subjective response to his art I, I believe this i believe that ai is going to be a kind of an evolutionary tool that will go through the phase of devastating all kinds of uh, careers and crafts and art uh, literary arts in particular music crafts as well uh, but then it will become a tool i think it will become molded to our our humanity uh, we have a, an amazing way to transcend and overcome and triumph, no matter what is thrown at us. And the fellow that posed the question is actually an interesting chap who makes, uh, who uses algorithms to create video art. So he has these bizarre abstractions on 50 inch screens that have all kinds of raison d'etre behind them, mathematical and electronic engineer, PhD. And uh, very, we'll be doing an exhibition actually for the Getty uh, next year of his work. A very interesting question he, he posed. One of the things I, I appreciate about Pai's work, um, just in general, is is his um, his desire to bring the whole discussion down to earth. You know, one of the reasons that he does his his little critique of Ruskin and Morris is because he, he wants to take all that rhetoric and ask questions of it. You know, practical questions, um, and uh, he, you know, he does that well. And uh, you know, for example, uh, Patrick, you mentioned his his great uh, description of what handmade means. Yeah, and he just takes it apart. He says, yeah. "Okay, handmade, but handmade using a tool. Handmade, you know, you know the uh, there are all kinds of other operations going on. Other." than the, the romantic idea of the handmade object. So it's, uh, I think part of the the, uh, the helpfulness of um, Pai's work is just to get us to think through practically the way a workman would, uh, what we mean by these terms and what we, what it actually is like to make something. And the issues that arise in the in the process of making at the same time you know as as you know uh patrick he's he's very philosophical and some of these themes it struck me were very 
uh, in spite of the critique of Ruskin, were very Ruskinian. For example, on page 30, he says, all workmanship is approximation. Yeah. There are in the world of manufacture and not only in that of metaphysics, certain ideas of which the things we make are necessarily imperfect copies. Nothing has ever been square because nothing has ever been straight, nor has anything been flat, nor spherical, cylindrical, uh, cubical. Um, he uh, then kind of concludes that whole section about uh, approximation by saying, um, this kind of approximation may be done on deliberately as for instance in the asymmetrical weaving of an essentially symmetrical pattern in some oriental rugs for magical reasons sure. or it may be done as making a virtue of necessity where the desire or need for economy prompts us to rough workmanship. But whatever reason we give for it, in all such cases, the workman admits to the work an element of the unaccountable, the unstudied, of improvisation, either deliberately or because he has not the time or ability to prevent it. And that's right out of the nature of Gothic. Exactly. No, no, exactly. Yeah. I was I was reflecting, I wrote a note in the passage that one of the, the comments about the genius of Mozart is why it works, mm. why it charms us in the way that it does is because Mozart uh, adheres to these absolutely regular patterns and then subverts them. You know, there's always the little regular pattern and then just at the moment where the brain is sort of settled in, oh, I see, there's a three pattern, a ba 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 then Mozart introduces something that you absolutely didn't expect, a turn of phrase, a, a shortening of the line in a way that, that, charms, that charms us. So it's always this... This essential poetry too. Yeah. Well, yeah. I didn't mention it, um, but Pi does talk about music as an analogy. Exactly, a lot. I, I play the stringed instruments, I play the viola, which has no frets. So when I put my finger down for a C or a D, I have to guess where that note is every time I'm taking a risk. And he talks <laughs> about um, a performance of a piece in music. Um, is aspiration by the musicians to fulfill the desire or the expectations of the composer. composer right. and so they're taking risks. Live performances of music are one of the most exciting things a human can experience. And it's because inherently you realize there's a risk. They might hit the wrong note, something, a string might break. Who knows what's going to happen when you go to a right. live performance. Now, if you play a record, you know what you're going to hear. <laughs> so that compares the two exactly is whether you're playing a record or recording or whether you're watching a performer take a risk to play something live. Also the difference between a performance of the same piece by Lang Lang or Baron Boim. On yeah, the completely different. Yeah. Right. And, and valued for the difference. And the discerning audience member appreciates that. That's right. Oh, and that's, the, that's a joy. To, to that's understand. the joy of it. And that goes back to the human, what, what we're also, I mean, just on a physiological, biological point of view, we know that doing things, doing things with our hands and, and writing and all these things, that they affect the brain, they light up the brain in a certain way. So you start removing that, and that's, to me, also got to be problematic down the line. The whole variety is the spice of life. <laughs> Let's take it one step further. Variety is the essence of life, and that fits that mold. That mm -hmm. fits the mold of of the of the work work of risk. Does and Pi Pi would use diversity instead of variety. Diversity is okay. Same same word. Yep. Same same meaning. Yeah. Well, wonderful. This is fantastic, and uh, yeah. the nice. Are we thing having is, fun? <laughs> it's recorded, and we have a core group here. We don't have the 12 or 14 people who signed up. We have three, six, eight. That's great. Oh. Nine. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, next time, um, we'll perhaps we'll have more people, but that this resource we're hey, building. 
Next time, can we do the history of Western philosophy? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Are you up for that? That's your yeah. That's Nine hundred pages. Okay. Three three hours. <laughs> yeah, Russell and Feynman, you are in good company there. Yeah, that's right. I had a I had a brilliant young uh, career. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank Wonderful. you so much. Thank you, My pleasure. Fantastic. Thank you, Patrick. You guys are great. We, well, See, before I. Um, I uh, close with some announcements. I uh, I can't resist um, after uh, uh, Pi does his critique of, of Morris and Ruskin, um, he um, feels like he needs to put five pounds of weight on the other side of the scale. So he ends it with, I think Ruskin propagated three important ideas. He saw before Japanese aesthetics were known in the West, that free and rough workmanship have aesthetic qualities which are unique. He also saw that in manufacture and building, there is a domain of aesthetic qualities which are beyond the control of design and insisted that architects with drawing boards could never have made Venice what it was. Mm. Thirdly, he described and understood the quality in things which I have termed diversity and understood its importance in the design of ornament, though not in workmanship. So I just thought uh, that, that's, that's insightful, actually. I thought Pi's notion of diversity, Patrick, is really very rich. Yeah, and that's what his goal is for certainty, to get to that point where you can have both uh, yes. certain things and with diversity among them. Yeah. Well, very good. Um, we, uh, as you all know, have a study session on Saturday. Uh, we're experimenting a little bit. We're doing uh, study sessions rather than on specific Ruskin works. We're doing a kind of thematic thematic study. So on Saturday, 10 to 11.30, uh, please let me know if you're coming. Um, uh, I'm going to do the first session and kind of lead us on a on a... Uh, we're going to take a look at mainly modern painters too, and Ruskin's definitions of beauty, uh, and to kind of take a look at Ruskin in the early stages of his exploration of this theme. And then David, in the second second week uh, on the nineteenth, uh, David's going to take us on a little more on a broader uh, examination of Ruskin's evolution on the issue of beauty in his later works, assisted by uh, Robert Hewison's chapter, which we will post in uh, The Argument of the Eye of Ruskin on Beauty, which kind of traces the the uh, the trajectory of Ruskin's uh, uh, evolution on, on, on this issue. So lots of lots of rich fare uh, for our uh, late summer. Uh, uh, <laughs> our late summer enrichment. Uh, also, of course, everybody remember that we are now only um, roughly a month away from the Ruskin Lecture at USC on September 12th, Tuesday, September 12th, with Dinah Birch uh, on the subject of Ruskin and gender. Uh, this is really going to be a very rich uh, time with Dinah, who has uh, become something of the kind of leading scholar uh, in this in this area in particular. So um, if there's Tyson, can you think of anything else we should mention? Um, nope, we have, we have a board meeting in a few weeks, folks, but other than that, um, yeah. yes, well, that's not that's not public. that's not an event. <laughs> not an event. Well, it may be an event, but it's you know <laughs> All right. Well, listen, see you all on Saturday. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. Thank, you. thank you, Patrick. Nice, nice to meet you, Patrick. Yeah, thank you, Joseph. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.